Tonight, we have a special guest in studio. Billy Corrigan, the founder of Smashing Pumpkins, uh, is in studio with us to talk about the media, music, what's happening right now, and what he sees in the future. Billy, great to have you in studio with us. Thank you, Alex. Happy to be here. Wow. Uh, you're here for South by Southwest. How are you liking it? It's a little crazy, <laughs> as you know, as an Austin person. It's a, all of a sudden, all the beard people showed up. <laughs> the trendies, as you call them, right? Lots of trendies showed up with beards and white vans. I did notice that. And, and, and like pastel pinks and greens. Yeah. Prancing. <laughs> I didn't see that, but um, I, I, I did see a lot of people like this with the cell phones, you know. So. Oh, and they walk out in front of traffic? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's good to have you here. Uh, tell us about the speech you were here giving, and you had a little run-in with Al Gore. I did. I did. Well, technically speaking, I made the president, the vi former vice president, wait for me, um, <laughs> which was pretty funny. Um, it's a little payback for, for so <laughs> something from the past. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was here uh, at a conference, uh, social media and how it's changing the business models. Um, in essence, it's essentially revolutionizing the business models because the consumer is, in essence, talking back. And so uh, it's about where, where the music industry has sort of gotten it wrong in the last 10 years. When, when you know, with the rise of Napster, the, the music business kind of covered their ears and thought it was all going to go away. And it's uh, really hollowed out the music business in many ways. And so um, there, is, there is a movement there that needs to be headed. Um, I'm not saying I'm the head of it, but I'm, I'm part of a, a core group artist that wants to come back to where uh, artistic expression and integrity is sort of at the core of the music business. It was a good business model for a long time. There was there were a lot of flaws, but essentially a lot of great work was created. And now you talk to most people, particularly 20 year olds, they're just not very uh, connected to their music because the corporate aspect of it and the, and the message behind it has really alienated a lot of people. And they've turned to other things. They've turned to video games, they've turned to... But, you know, music no longer has that sort of special place in the culture. It, it has, you know, seemed to lose that real rebel quality that you saw across the board in music just 20 years ago. We were talking about that at dinner last night. How did that happen? Well, I think any time uh, you have a c c corporate interest becomes the dominating theme. I mean, it's a central theme of what you talk about in your broadcasts, where corporate interest has taken over America. I mean, you can go back to the founding fathers of America. They were working their own corporate interests. I mean, it had a lot to do with the decisions they made in, 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 in Philadelphia in the late 1700s, but it was balanced against a set of constitutional rights and the idea that, well, this particular model, a free model, a great society is going to yield a greater result. And as you like to point out many times, I mean, America was an incredibly uh, successful experiment for a long time. It evolved. And then somewhere along the way, we've kind of just gone like that, where corporate uh, interest has completely taken over our political structure. And it's also taken over our musical structure where you have, I mean, yes, it's a business. As somebody once said, it is a music business. But when it, when it, when it is the prime driving force, well, then, of course, you're going to get into things that are salacious and, and in essence, uh, overtly negative to the culture because they're just serving a particular interest. And there is a point where we all have to be responsible for our community standard. We all have to be responsible for the messages we put out. I mean, I've said lots of crazy things, done a lot of crazy things, but I've always had an intention in the back of my mind that something I was doing or the collective amount of things that I was doing were going to help somebody somewhere. If, if, you're, if your complete intention is, is to do nothing but profit on the backs of others, well, then you, you know where that's going to go. You mentioned the founders, and I think you really brought up a point that I've thought about a lot but never articulated, but reading their writings and what they did, they were inventors, they were really into knowledge, and sure, they were you know, corporate businessmen, but they were really into the fact that we're so confident, we're so smart, we're not intimidated by other people having freedom. They were kind of in and, and talked about this wild experiment of freedom. And you look at the corporate structures globally today, they are scared to death of any freedom. And so they're stifling that. And I think that's really uh, pretty simple, but at the same time, it's complex. Well, I, I think uh, from a political standpoint, anywhere where you see dissent being stifled, wh where is the fear? I mean, or, or should I say, why is the fear there? Um, most people I talk to that would say have a problem with the government, they don't sit around and talk about anarchy or overthrowing the government. They just want to see a government that represents... Uh, 
their sort of uh, community uh, value. And, and, and I'm not necessarily one side or the other. You know, I, I, I've got people in my family that are total right-wing Republicans. Some of them are probably even racist. But they, they at least have a particular opinion that they're coming from that is rooted in their own belief system. When all you have is corporate interests driving something, well, then it's got nothing to do with belief. It's about looking at you and saying, how can I strip this man or this woman or this family of their resources? And that particular aspect is sort of haunting to us as Americans because even if we were raised in propaganda, which you and I probably were, we were at least raised to believe America is a great country. It represents these values. You know, we freed the slaves. We, you know, we helped uh, uh, stop the Holocaust. You know, we, we, we grew up with a sense of personal ethic about what our country represented. The corporate globalism is so cold-blooded. It's so robotic. Well, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, you address it, you know, with, with great frequency. And I think, um, I, I, I use that word again, there's sort of a haunting feeling. It's like, like, I get it. Like, I get you want to make money, you know, I get you want to sell me something. But it's, it's when it's at the expense of my community, when it's at the expense of the values of the people around me. And, you know, people don't even talk to their neighbors. And they're all so locked into this, we talked about last night, kind of a narcoleptic state where the TV is enough or the computer is enough. Um, that's a scary thing, you know, and so there is a connection there between uh, kind of a stifling dissent, uh, you know, uh, what did Obama say coming in? I want to run this great uh, open government, transparent was, I believe, the word they used. And, and now you've seen where they, they go out of their way to stifle dissent. It's, I don't, the, it's the most closed government. Right. But, I, but what I say from an artistic point of view and as somebody who's been in the media and at the top levels of media, and of course, I know plenty of things that go on behind the scenes. Uh, why are we so afraid of that dissent? You know, what, what is the problem? I mean, isn't that the point of a democracy? You're supposed to have a kind of a riotous debate about who's right. Um, there should, it should be an uncomfortable conversation. There should be kind of a, uh, that's the whole point. Exactly, they're always saying, well, you can have your free speech as long as it's not uncomfortable. Or as long, as long as it's 300 feet down the road, yeah. <laughs> away from where the limos go in the, in the back door, you know? But, but it, it is the uncomfortable speech. That's what's really important. Yes, and that's why I appreciate what you're doing. I, I think you raise a lot of points that are uncomfortable, but they're necessary towards the greater dialogue about where our country is at the moment and where it's going. And, of course, as, as alternative media, which you know, you're know you a pioneer in, as it reveals a different narrative than we've been sold, there's an uh, awareness and awakening that goes on because you start looking at history and go, okay, wait a second, that thing I was told about this, maybe that's not so true. And then you start looking at things from a different point of evaluation. I, I think the biggest mistake we all make is trying to find a form of absolutism. There is no one truth. There is no one definitive black and white answer. It is always going to be sort of shades of gray. I just have a hard time understanding why there's this fear that's rising up around the discussion. And that, to me, that's a, that's, a big, that's a big red flag. Well, the system knows that as it consolidates power, people subconsciously are smart and understand there's a threat. So the system is very adept at projecting people's natural anxiety over things going in the wrong direction onto some boogeyman. And, and, the, and the social engineers, they know that. Uh, we, we talked a lot when we went to dinner last night, Billy, about media tricks or trying to keep people in the box. And, you know, when you were speaking about it, you know, all these data points were coming to my mind. It was, you, I mean, you were absolutely on target with how they're trying to control reality. Speak to that. Well, um, I can use my own example. Um, you know, I'm essentially lower middle class. You know, no one from my family went to college. I obviously have some gifts that are valuable. Um, the minute I entered into a, a bigger, uh, wider swath of media, I was sort of categorized. And when I resisted the categorization, I was demonized. You know, now somebody would say, well, that's just rock and roll. But having been in that game for 20 years, there is this overt pressure to put yourself in that particular narrative. And if you won't, you will be sort of labeled and tagged. And uh, it's fascinating for me now to go back and read articles about myself from 18 years ago where I'm sort of being put into categories and labeled a certain way. And, and then it's that weird thing, it's like a Kafka. You know, you're accused of a crime, you don't know what you did that was so wrong, and then you spend the rest of your life defending it. And, um, and so I'm very keen to watch how other people are demonized 
from uh, media entry points. When somebody rises up with a grand new idea, the way it's either co-opted, you know, like, oh, let's say, let's, let's assume um, for the sake of argument that the Occupy movement started as an organic expression of somebody, you know, somebody said, let's do this. Ten people, four people. You saw right away where it was co-opted. You know what I mean? Uh, or, or other media forces tried to disclaim it and distance. And those are the ways that the media sort of tries to take things that they can't control and put it in a box. And then they start to write, they write the articles, what does this mean? Uh, uh, Bloomberg comes out and says, uh, Occupy New York is bad for business. So the common person says, oh, that's hurting us. Well, in the greater expression of freedom, maybe it's a good thing that we're having this dissent. Maybe the small downside of blocking traffic or something in the, in the greater whole is a necessity. Exactly. I mean, if America, 5% of the world population developed half the wealth because it had more freedom than anybody else, not that we were perfect, then how is it bad that people are exercising their liberty? Even if they don't have all the answers, at least they're trying to get involved. So the real question is, why is Bloomberg demonizing it? Or, 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 the, or the way Homeland Security coordinated to try to take down everybody's protests, you know? I think those are all a really bad, big red flag. Why are they so scared of people even exercising their First Amendment? That's a really, uh, that's a question I don't have the answer for. I think it's one of those things where you can only look at the reaction to gauge that there, there must be really something vital going on, or there wouldn't have been such a, an anti, there wouldn't have been such a violent reaction against the Occupy movement if what the Occupy movement was, was representing in a, as a whole wasn't threatening to somebody. You know, and that's why they try to sort of categorize it down into boxes. It's bad for business. Uh, it could lead to violence. It hasn't yet, but it might. You know, this kind of implied nuance. Yet, it was mostly just a bunch of people in tents, you know. And I, I particularly didn't agree with all of the Occupy message. I, I, I'm not here to wave the flag for it. I think there's certain aspects of troubling, troubling aspects about it, particularly the idea of wealth distribution. You know, in my particular instance, you know, my, I came from a family that didn't have anything. Everything I've earned in life, I made myself with songs that I wrote. So when somebody starts talking about how I've got to give to somebody that didn't do that, well, that's a, that's a deeper conversation. It doesn't mean I don't have a social concern. It doesn't mean I don't want to contribute to charities. It doesn't mean I don't want to help my fellow man. But if you look at Austin where I live, all these young kids of middle class or wealthy they don't appreciate anything on average because it was all given to them. And again, it's America's not been perfect, but it's been better than most other systems because it was an avenue that allowed your natural gifts to be expressed. Whereas in an old world model, it was completely shut down by the elite. And that's what I found is that you have these crony capitalists who are really anti-free market, anti-libertarian ideas. And they basically are trying to get a big government system so that they have government power to shut down their competition. I think it's a really valid point. Um, I can only speak from my perspective as an artist because, um, you know, there's different terms that you can use, you know, outlier is one of them, you know. If you exist sort of outside of given system, and I've been in the system, I've been outside the system, and now I'm probably standing right on the edge of the system, um, it's still, it's, you know, like you and I were talking about it today. Uh, I did a, a thing, this thing at South by Southwest where I gave an hour talk with an author who's uh, an expert in social media. Um, he's written this book. Uh, Brian Solis is his name. We had a one-hour discussion in front of 1,500 people, and the headline reads, Billy Corgan rants. You know what I mean? I don't understand how that's a rant an hour discussion, a sober discussion with two intelligent people about a very complex set of ideas, opinions included, that's not a rant. But that's that kind of language that gets encoded in. Don't be too smart, don't step outside, don't stand for anything. And I think what I really see with young people now is they want to, they're, they, they're responding to passion. And so uh, us as people getting a little older in life, we have to help direct that passion. Uh, and, 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 and what I love, uh, uh, for me, when you really hit the right target is when you talk about liberty 
and, and what liberty really means, the responsibility of liberty, the responsibility of freedom. It's not just this utopian anarchy. We have a responsibility to each other. What is that responsibility? Well, that's a, that should be an open debate. What is your responsibility as a, as a man, as a parent, as a citizen of Texas, to your community, to the people who work here in your business? What is your responsibility? You have to address all those things. You have to openly debate them within your own mind, and then you're enough of a, of a humanitarian or a, an insane person or whatever. You want to take those ideas into the marketplace uh, to be bandied about. That's a 